Um, hi, thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, really want to thank the organizers for putting us all together um, in this panel together session. Um, I will say that um, this paper is kind of a working through some of the thinking of that, uh, that paradox that Nicholas, Nicholas mentioned earlier about sort of living in this time of the Anthropocene, or you know, if you want to think of it that way, and the paradox of sort of decentering the human. So uh, this is perhaps one small gesture towards that thinking. Um, and I'd like to just start out with a little quote from my field notes. We stop at a patch of devil's club, and Mary talks about her techniques for harvesting it. Mary explains that Souvier taught her that like us, plants have a body, mind, and spirit, that you should give something back to the plant for what you take, and that how you harvest affects the medicine the plant gives. This short excerpt from a late summer field note is one of many from Northwest Indian College traditional plants and foods classes that I have attended over the years as both a student and teacher of plant worlds. The classes are held to promote health and healing in Northwest coastal indigenous communities through the revitalization of traditional food and medicine practices. The program is an enactment of Bruce Subiai Miller's vision. And as the field note suggests, this work is enduringly guided by the spirit and intent of his teachings. Subiai was a Skokomish elder, healer, artist, and plant person. His work with the plants lives on through the ongoing work of his numerous apprentices, including Mary. Subiai is never very far from the minds of the plant people who apprenticed with him. A commonly repeated quote of his is that the plants are our greatest teachers, that all the wisdom we need for living on earth is contained in the plants themselves. Mary is fond of saying that this is a difficult concept for the Western mind to grasp. How can beings that are so different from ourselves, that have no language, be teachers? Yet clearly the plants themselves, quite literally, are teachers for Mary and for others. Once when we'd stepped outside the Burke Museum for a break from a workshop, Mary pointed to a patch of bright blue flowering periwinkle. That is my first plant teacher, she told me. She went on to explain that once, when she was very young, maybe 12 or so, she had a terrible headache and lay down near some periwinkle, which spoke to her. Eat me, it said. It was only later that she learned that periwinkle is widely recognized for this healing quality. I frequently refer to myself as a plant person. My life is thoroughly entangled with the worlds of plants, and I think of myself as someone who is sensitized to their presence. Yet, like the typical Westerner that Mary describes, I too struggle with how a plant might be a teacher, not just metaphorically or filtered through a cultural worldview, but literally. So what I wish to explore here is the possibility that rather than simply being represented ideologically by humans, through their own communicative capacities, plants might actually reveal something of themselves to humans, teaching us things in the process. Understanding the communicative capacities of plants entails recognizing them as intelligent, agentive beings. In the ethnographic literature, indigenous understandings of non-human agencies are, have traditionally been treated under the banner of animism. Even the most sensitive of anthropologists, while acknowledging the significance and value of the affective force of animism from a moral and ethical perspective, have typically treated these systems not as forms of knowledge that the people who follow such systems possess about the worlds that they inhabit, but rather as a belief system that is grounded in a given culture's worldview or cosmology. This ethnocentric transfer of other people's ideas about non-human agency from the realm of knowledge to that of belief leads to at least two troubling forms of asymmetry. First, it reinforces the anthropocentric notion that humans are the only beings in the world that can possibly possess the capacity for thought, as well as the troubling practice in which, at the end of the day, other people's knowledge about other than human selves is measured against a mechanistic understanding of non-human nature so prevalent in traditions of Western scientific thought about the natural world. In How Forests Think Toward an Anthropology Beyond the Human, Edward Cohn diagnoses this problem as a particular kind of anthropocentrism, 
in which we restrict the ca capacity for representation, telos, intentionality, aboutness, and selfhood to that of symbolic communication, which is, to the best of our knowledge, a uniquely human capacity. And I'm having a debate with my advisor about that at this moment. So. Uh, rather, Cohen encourages us to rethink our understandings of represent representation to provincialize language through a more expansive understanding of the forms that representation takes within and beyond the worlds of humans. Cohn draws on Persian semiotics and yet Jacob von Uskol's theory of meaning to, to develop this anthropology beyond the human. This biosemiotic approach is grounded in the premise that life is both material and semiotic, that every life form, from the cell to the organism, is intelligent and dependent on the capacity for meaning making. As Cohn neatly summarizes, Life forms, human and non-human alike, because they are intrinsically semiotic, exhibit what Peirce calls a scientific intelligence. By scientific, he does not mean an intelligence that is human, conscious, or even rational, but simply one that is capable of learning by experience. In other words, life itself is a sign process, and as such, is governed by semiotic rules rather than mechanistic laws. Conscious purpose is not a requirement of semiosis. Indeed, we share a great deal with plants in that, like them, we too do not think without our heads. <clears throat> the premise of Ushkul's theory of meaning is grounded in the con concept of Umwelt. The Umwelt, or self-centered world, is the subjective, meaningful universe of a particular, autonomous living being, as constituted by the relations between specific per perceptual signs and signs of action. Since each self, and by extension, its own belt, is autonomous, there are as many worlds as there are selves. Semiosis, the use and production of signs, is thus a relational process of communication between a living being and its own belt, a process of worlding. <coughs> Yet, given that all of life is the result of the same evolutionary processes, there is a meaningful structural correspondence between the own mountain of different living beings within a species and those of living beings of different species, according to a general plan of nature. This structural correspondence of all unbelted collectively is what constitutes the semiosphere. The semiotic theories of Charles Peirce are broad enough to encompass the vastness of the semiosphere. The nature of the sign lies at the heart of this theory. For Peirce, a sign is something which stands to somebody for something in some respect or capacity. The sign is a medium for the communication of a form, a thought, a habit, or abstract quality of some type. Peirce's system categorizes signs as being of three types according to their semiotic capacities. Iconic signs mean by virtue of resemblance, indexical signs by virtue of correlation, and symbolic signs by virtue of pure convention. Symbolic signs are purely arbitrary. There is no necessary association between a symbolic sign and its meaning. The biosemiotician Kalevi Kuhl has proposed that the capacities for thought of specific life forms correspond to an evolutionary sequence, with iconicity being the oldest form of semiosis and corresponding to the unbelted and vegetal life, including cells and plants, followed by indexicality and corresponding to the unbelton of non-human animals, and finally, symbolic systems and the unbelton of humans and our particular cultural worlds. These semiotic forms are nested, such that iconicity is shared across the spectrum of life. If Kuhl's theory is correct, then iconicity is a sufficient condition for the biosphere to be created. How might a biosemiotic approach to ethnography invigorate our understandings and relationships, both with and about non-human others and the people with whom we work with that know something of non-human intelligence and thought? Drawing on a portion of the semiosphere comprising Big Huckleberry, or Swadok, as it is known in the Coast Salish Lashutsi language, I gesture towards an anthropology comprised not just of the worldviews of humans, but also the life worlds of both human and non-human alike. To this end, I focus on semios semiosis having to do with nutrition, as all forms of life share this commonality in that all beings are alive to the extent that they are able to be nourished. Swadok is found in mid-elevation meadows, primarily throughout the Pacific Northwest. For at least 6,000 years, 
in the late summertime when the days are simultaneously hot and carry the cool undertones of the coming autumn on the breeze, people have been traveling to the mountains to harvest the sweet blue-black berries when they ripen. Swadoff meadows are an oasis in the dense middle elevation forests where, in addition to the berries, many other plants and animals thrive. Along with their human harvesters, deer and elk, black and grizzly bear, mountain beaver, marmot, and other small mammals, as well as several species of resident and migratory birds, also rely on the foliage and fruit of Swadok and the other plants that grow along with it. As with other forms of vegetal life, much of Swadok communication can be difficult for humans to perceive. Biosemioticians explain that plant communication occurs primarily by way of infochemicals, much of which takes place underground in the rhizosphere. Following in the intellectual footsteps of Charles Darwin, plant neurobiologists propose that the plant's body plan is an inversion to, of that of animals, such that plants literally have their heads in the ground and their reproductive organs in the air. But unlike animals, plants have as many brains as they have roots, each one behaving something like an animal forager that seeks information, process it, processes it, and both changes its individual behavior and also influences collective root brain behaviors according, accordingly. The root brains are connected through their neuron-like vascular tissues. The animal's nerve cells and the plant's phloem cells serve the same purpose, conducting electrical signals. The hormone auxin is the primary neurotransmitter, which conveys iconic codes throughout the plant's body enabling the roots to behave as a swarm as they process these vast amount of decentered information. As with many higher elevation ericaceous plants, Swadok forms symbiotic relations with ericoid mycorrhizae, which helps them to cope with these difficult growing conditions. Mycorrhizal relationships further extend the plant's underground social networks, potentially connecting both related and unrelated species. In addition to increasing the amount of moisture and nutrients available to them, these mycelial networks are also informational networks that have the potential to transport infochemicals. This information in turn enables plants to not only ensure the movement of nutrients and water to portions of the root system where it is needed, but also to warn plants of herbivory and to transfer fungal disease resistance signals. Flavonoids are identified as among the key infochemicals used in these my mycelial plant communication networks. The anthocyanins comprise a subset of the flavonoids, which are responsible for the red and blue pigmentation of the huckleberry flowers and fruit. The pinkish urn-shaped flowers of Swadok serve as an indexable sign of their nectar to the long-nosed bees that pollinate them. Later in the season, these same secondary compounds will give the fruits of Swadok their deep blue color, indexably signaling from a distance to the bear, bird, human, and other animal foragers that, the, that their delectable fruits are ripe. Steve, an avid big huckleberry harvester, observes that their deliciousness is a sign that the berries want us to eat them. Down in the lowlands, the flowering fireweed or the call of the red flicker might notify the attentive forager that the time has come to travel to the mountains to harvest Swadok. When I ask him how he knows it's time to go to the mountains to harvest big huckleberry, Scott, who for 40 years has been traveling to the same place to harvest them, tells me that Mother Nature just taps him on the shoulder. He describes the weather as an indexical sign, a feeling in the air that tells him when he should be up on the mountain. Like many harvesters, Scott also values big huckleberry for their nutritive qualities. They're off the charts in antioxidants, he tells me. This indexical association of anthocyanin pig pigments with human health contributes to the importance of Swadok as a traditional food in indigenous communities. As my teacher, Muckleshoot tribal member Warren King George, has attested many times, the medicinal properties can address some extremely serious health issues among native communities in the 21st century. The antioxidant properties of Swadok has also helped to fuel a multi-million dollar global trade in big huckleberry as a nutraceutical. Here, the iconic, indexical, and symbolic communicative qualities of Swadok blur into one another, creating a cacophony of meaning. What kinds of iconic biochemical communications occur between the cells of our bodies and the anthocyanins of the fruit when we consume them? 
Certainly, the chemical constituents are meanings that matter a great deal, but there are also the ways in which that communion indexes our identities, responsibilities, and connections to place. In the plateau longhouses on the east side of the Cascades, the Sahaptan and interior Salish people will hold their first fruit ceremonies before their journeys to the mountains to harvest the fruit. The ceremony indexes the time when the Creator was making the world ready for the human people to come, and is an enactment of the mutual responsibility between human and other than human selves, along with the water, the roots, the salmon and elk, and the choke cherry, Big Huckleberry offered itself to feed the human people to come. In turn, the human people care for the first foods, acknowledging and remembering this responsibility in their longhouse ceremonies. Big Huckleberry harvesters also often speak of how, in the dark winter months when the berries are taken from the freezer, mixed in with their morning oatmeal or made into a holiday pie, the smell and taste of the berries transports them back in time and place to the late summer berry meadows, to childhood memories, to the sense of what it means to belong to a people and a place. As Scott noted, it's almost a spiritual thing and really quite hard to explain. Big huckleberry is also what we might call a recalcitrant species. Domestication cannot be cultivated, will not produce fruit, or even live for very long when transplanted into lowland gardens. It is in part this wildness that is transmogrified into jams, syrups, soaps, lotions, and candles that serve as icons for something of what the Pacific Northwest means to the people who purchase these items. This sort of pure and wild property blends with the nutraceutical qualities of the berry as it makes its way in powdered form to far-flung places like Japan, where it is sold as a treatment for cataracts and glaucoma. These examples call attention to some of the ways in which the work of biosemioticians opens up the possibility for non-mechanistic forms of scientific understanding. Biosemiotics shows us how all living beings, including plants, are subjects in that they are communicating selves and to the possibility that if we are open to them, plants can communicate with us too. Given that the work of the biosemioticians and the plant neurobiologists as well occur primarily in the lab, as ethnoecologists who work closely with holders of indigenous and local forms of knowledge, there are collaborative opportunities for extending our understandings of biosemiotics to people-plant communication in the field. This brings us back to the question of how plants can be teachers, which is a question not just of how plants nourish our bodies, but how, through spending time with them, listening to, and noticing them, they also nourish our souls. Soubier was fond of telling his students of plants, his students that plants teach by example, as their therapeutic benefits to humans attest, plants, immediately immersed in their dwelling worlds as they are, are certainly iconic examples of a kind of admirable zen-like presence and comfortable calm. As the philosopher Michael Martyr notes, whereas humans remember whatever has phenomenally appeared in the light, plants keep the memory of light itself. Indeed, the harvesters who spend time with them remark on the incredible sense of peace and calm that Ping Swadok affords them as they are also the root and source of nourishment for nearly every other form of life on the planet, plants in general are also an expression of a kind of primordial generosity that gives itself to all other creatures, animating all of life with their selfless gifts. It is also true that these kinds of relations can only be maintained in practice. Here, I wish to acknowledge the great Nisqually fish warrior, Billy Frank Jr., who, for more than half a century, fought not only for the treaty reserved rights of the first people of Washington State to fish, but also for the fish themselves ensuring that the salmon people would be there to fish, now and into the future. At his memorial service last Sunday, a friend spoke about how Frank would refer to animals with titles like Mr. Beaver and Mr. Eagle. His friend once told Frank that he talked like they were people. He said, well, yes, but when we aren't around, they talk about us like we are animals. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
My Coast Salish teachers are fond of reminding me that indigenous ways of teaching and learning take place in the field. There are no books, smiles Warren in a film about Soubier's life. I am also told that the moral and meaning of Coast Salish stories are left for the listener to ponder and learn on their own. The work of the Coast Salish plant teacher, I think, is the work of a storyteller, to gesture towards a way of noticing and listening, rather than telling the student what it is that he or she is supposed to notice and hear. To be able to notice and hear Swadok requires that they are there for us to spend time with. Here, I read the Shrinking Meadows Indexically, its histories of care and liveliness as an indigenous place, its transformation into colonial space, and attendant effects of changing property and land management regimes, the shading out of Swadok by growing trees. The silences of this place also communicate quite loudly. Can the huckleberry speak? Can we speak with the huckleberry? How might this happen still remains somewhat of a mystery to me, but I do know that the flourishing of Swadok in a cacophony of communication requires our attention.